I'm Donnie Same, a professor at the University of Nebraska and chief of ophthalmology at the uh, Children's Hospital. And Dr. Serena Wong is a um, associate professor at the Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And we have a very exciting program um, prepared for you. Uh, first, I would like to take a quick question. I am blank, please. I'm gonna give you uh, 10 seconds. So we're gonna have five questions and I would like to know who um, we are talking to. We have 1,700, 1,700 uh, uh, participants registered today. So we have uh, mostly general ophthalmologists and uh, we have optometrists and pediatric ophthalmologists. And then we have um, other specialists. Okay, next. Uh, is a um, timing of surgery. When do you perform unilateral cataract surgery? At birth or just wait till two weeks or two to six weeks or seven to eight weeks, around two months of age. Number five is around three months of age, nine to 12 weeks. So if it, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. And these questions are based on the questions that, the, uh, they were, uh, requ that, uh, that were requested. Um, on the survey. And it looks like most perform between two to six weeks, which is actually pretty consistent with, with what I do. Okay, next, I would like to ask timing of bilateral cataracts. So if it's a bilateral cataract that's uh, visually significant at birth, um, when do you do the first eye? Um, I know in some countries they do both eyes at the same time, um, but for the uh, for this question, like when is the time of the first uh, cataract surgery? At birth, less than two weeks, two to six, seven to eight, nine to 12 weeks for bilateral cataracts. The answer, uh, it looks like it's about the same. Um, two to six weeks is the earliest, um, I mean, is the most common, and then seven to eight weeks, okay? At what age do you try to place the IOL in congenital cataracts? Uh, for unilateral cataract case, unilateral cases, um, again, the questions are never, right at birth, or do, like uh, if uh, the um, seven to 12 months, 13 to 24 months, and then uh, last uh, and then uh, greater than two, and or do you just prefer no IOL? Again, perfect. So most people place it uh, if they're greater than two. So they leave them aphakic, it looks like, um, uh, till two years of age. Okay, great. Next question is that if for the bilateral cataracts or bilateral cataracts, when do you uh, place the IOL? Never from birth to six months of age, seven to 12 months, 13 to 24 months, greater than two, and no pref uh, preferred, no IOL for bilateral cases. So this is a question for visually significant cataract and for those who have performed the, uh, the cataract surgeries. And the response, so again, the the response is uh, it's pretty um, predominantly, 58% says, greater than two years of age. Okay, great. All right, so just in general, this is what I do. Again, there's no right and, uh, there's no, uh, right and wrong answer. For the unilateral dense congenital cataracts, uh, for the most part, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, for, you know, I do between four to 10 weeks of age for healthy babies. And of course, if there's any medical uh, problems uh, that would uh, that would um, would require delay, uh, then we may have to do it later. Um, the studies have shown that the risk of glaucoma with earlier cataract surgery is higher if it's performed less than four weeks of age. So that's the reason why I tried to avoid um, uh, cataract surgeries before then. And for the bilateral dense cataracts, uh, it's between two to three months. Um, um, and I usually wait only about uh, two to four weeks uh, between the cases. Bilateral surgery on same day is typically not recommended, but in certain countries where 
<clears throat> the, the cost and the risk of anesthesia is high or is not available, is not readily available, then they would have no choice but to perform the surgeries on uh, both on, this, uh, on the same setting. And this does happen um, even in this country. Um, in terms of the surgery, uh, the success truly depends on the planning. The planning is the most critical part. Um, and because a lot of things can happen with these congenital cataract surgeries and the danger is always is, um, um, is um, lurking. And things can happen very, very quickly, as you all know. Um, and, and with the proper planning, you can avoid these disastrous um, uh, um, uh, situations. So you, the planning makes you avoid uh, you playing with fire. So we're going to talk about the planning. So when you plan these surgeries, you have to modify the surgical technique based on what you're dealing with. And what are some of the things that I think about when I'm looking at the cataracts? I look at the interior chamber depth. Is it deep enough for me to be able to perform the surgery? Uh, would I have to deepen it? Am I gonna be able to place the IOL? So the size of the pupil, I have very low threshold of placing pupillary dilators, um, uh, pupil dilators, iris hooks or whatever that's required to dilate the pupil because I think in my opinion, the most important part of the cataract surgery in, in pediatric patients, like in adults, is the anterior capsulotomy. And if you don't have a good view of the anterior capsule, uh, the, the surgery could go, um, uh, could go could become disastrous in a matter of a, of a second. And is the eyeball big enough? Where is the location of the cataract? Where is the opacity? Is in the posterior capsule? Is in the anterior capsule? Is in the nucleus? Am I able to see the posterior capsule uh, and appreciate the posterior lenticonus? So when I hydro dissect, is this gonna is the posterior capsule is gonna be strong enough to withstand that pressure? Is there a significant trauma that uh, that affected the zonules? Is there a significant anterior segment dysgenesis? Um, is the iris healthy enough? Is, it, um, is there posterior synechiae? And I look for anatomical abnormalities. And after reviewing all these things in my mind, then I, have a, then I develop a surgical plan. Um, the important thing is that whatever you plan, you have to keep it simple. Um, what Steve Jobs said, if you can get there and keep it simple, you can move a mountain. And I firmly, firmly believe this. You wanna keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the four pro um, poor prognostic factors include unilateral cases because the treating amblyopia for these patients can be somewhat challenging. So the visual outcome may not be as, um, as good as for the bilateral cataracts. Smaller eyes, whether it's a microphthalmia or persistent fetal vasculature, the, um, they tend to have a um, worse um, uh, prognosis because th there's a significant anatomical abnormality. And then uh, associated with ocular abnormalities like the Peters anomalies and the systemic disease uh, with patients, for example, with a juvenile idiopathic arthritis with the inflammation. Uh, inflammation. For the surgical consideration, um, um, Placing on IOL or no IOL, this is a big concern. Um, this is one of the questions that uh, many of you have brought up. Relative IOL contraindications include children with chronic inflammatory disease, such as JIA. Uh, I used to be a lot more daring um, 20 years ago when I started working. So if the patient was under control and there's absolutely no inflammation within three months, I used to put IOL. But now I think I tend to be just a little bit more conservative. Um, um, you know, that three months used to, went to six months and nine months. And now I'm at a point where if there's any signs of, J, if there's any uh, history of significant uh, uh, anterior uveitis, I tend to not place IOL. Of course, there are other mitigating factors, but I tend to go against the uh, IOL placement. Uh, but what are some of those mediga mitigating factors? I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And if the eyeball's less than uh, nine, if it's a nine millimeters or less, then I typically um, 
do not place IOL. IOL considerations, uh, you know, if they're unilateral cases, I tend to put the IOL sooner than later because these patients, you're going to have to deal with anisometropia. Uh, and with a significant anisoconia, you're increasing the chance of uh, amblyopia. If they have nystagmus, contact lens is going to be difficult. Uh, dry eyes in patients with the um, uh, keratoconjunctivita seca or any other type of uh, um, um, uh, significant dry eyes due to different metabolic disorders or uh, um, uh, different uh, um, autonomic dis dysfunctions, um, I tend to consider play placing an IOL because contact lenses is going to be very difficult. If they live in a dirty, sandy living conditions, like for example, Northern Africa, uh, where it's very windy, there's a lot of sand in the air. So those patients, I tend to lean toward placing an IOL. Uh, limited access to contact lenses. In some cases, at some places around the world, the aphakic contact lenses, uh, the, sil the sil soft, and those lenses are not available or the cost is limiting. So those patients in those situations, I would place an IOL. Uh, compliance concerns, uh, behavioral issues with ADHDs or autism or other type of developmental delays and cost and follow up if it's an issue, IOL I tend to uh, put in. So IOL, typically I place, it, I place them in seven months or older um, because the studies have shown that the, there's a higher uh, need for repeat surgery, not so much complications, but, but for repeat surgeries if it's performed less than seven months of age. Um, so um, with the, um, the fibrosis of the interior, uh, uh, for the anterior hyloid um, uh, of the, the vitreous uh, resulting in uh, repeat vitrectomy or repeat surgeries. Um, so I typically do not place IOL anyone less than seven months of age. If the corneal diameter is less than nine, I do not. But in some situations, uh, like the mitigating factors that I just showed you, uh, the, the lens, the PCIOL lens diameter is eight millimeters. So you can potentially remove the haptics and place just a lens inside the bag. And that actually, I've actually seen that happen when I visited India. Um, and three IOL calculations dilemma. How to measure axial length and what formula do you use and what are, um, uh, what power do you aim for? So this is actually some of the common questions that I, that I was asked. So I just wanted to spend just a few minutes. Um, conventional ultrasound biometry, applination versus, uh, applination versus immersion technique and optical biometry. Uh, for pediatric patients, most commonly we use applination technique because it's most convenient uh, and it's accurate if it's performed by the trained biometrist. Um, but you have to make sure you don't compress the cornea when you do this. You really have to have uh, the um, excellent technique uh, to do this. Immersion technique is perfectly acceptable. The optical biometry is typically not performed in pediatric patients uh, just because of the, um, you know, many of them, we actually have to put them to sleep because we cannot perform uh, the axial length and keratometry in an office setting. Um, the um, Remember, one millimeter error in the extra length calculations result in three doctors of uh, refractive errors, uh, either my, uh, depending on which direction. But if it's a short eye in pediatric patients, that error, every one millimeter, you're going to be off by 3.75 millimeter, uh, 3.5 doctors. So that's pretty significant. So you got to be very careful. Two school of thoughts. Do you aim for emetropia? or low power IOL. This is just a matter of preference. But uh, emetropia um, is a, if you plant a 28 doctor producing emetropia at eight months of age, this will reduce, this will most likely result in minus seven by the age of three. So this is a pretty significant myopia you're gonna have to deal with. And see, these, you're basically committing these patients to most likely contact lens fitting for the rest of their life. So this is, these are some of the things that you have to think about. So what I typically do, this is a target refraction that I aim for somewhere in between, um, uh, somewhere in this range. So typically, um, one, I do six just remember the number six, six minus one. So I go for five diopters. So two, I have six minus two is four. So that's where, what I go for. So I subtract the age from six and that's, uh, 
that's about, that's pretty close to the approximation, but that's the table that I go by. Uh, formula, uh, I pretty much use SRKT. There's no one formula that's far superior than the others, um, but typically Hoffer Q in a very short axial length, uh, in a baby with a very short axial length, I use Hoffer Q, but SRKT, uh, is what I use. Uh, the cause of, ref but you do end up with uh, refractive surprises and I had my share. Um, there are many reasons out there, but I would say this is one of the biggest one is a posterior staphyloma that you may have overlooked. And if you aim the, um, the, um, the ultrasound, uh, uh, when you're performing the ultrasound biometry, and if you miss that, that a small posterior staphyloma, uh, you may get a, a number that's uh, very, that may not be uh, optimal. Surgical techniques. Uh, Dr. Wong's going to go over this uh, a little bit more in detail later. Um, but uh, like I said, removing the enter capsule is truly, I think, in my opinion, is the most critical um, because that kind of sets the tone for the entire surgery. Um, the capsorexis is difficult. It is truly difficult and it's different than adult, pa adult patients. Why? It's thinner, elastic, and it has more convex, um, uh, it's more convex shaped. And it tears easily because it's thin and it's more elastic and it's got a radial force. And the anterior chamber is shallow, uh, chair is shallow in a smaller eye. And then also the sclera is less rigid with a low, uh, low IOP. Um, so as you're, as you're manipulating the, the tools, it tends to collapse and blur your vision easily. And then you don't get that nice uh, uh, bright red reflex on retroilluminations because most of these congenital cataracts are visually significant and they have white, uh, white um, um, cataract. So what are some of the tips? Uh, there, as you all know, we have a dispersive and cohesive um, uh, types of, of, um, of viscoelastics and the cohesive, um, um, so for example, the Helon, the Helon GB, those are the ones that's um, heavier, that's more cohesive property, as you can see here. It's more of a uh, gelatinous uh, consistency. So it tends to uh, form the interchamber better. So it makes the surgery easier. However, it tends to be a little bit more expensive and um, it is not readily available around the world. So most people that are performing these surgeries are, they have to resort to the dispersive um, OVD, which I think works just fine. It's like once you get the hang of it, I think it, uh, it, works, it works well. And the Tripen Blue, not only it stains the anterior capsule, but it does make it, I do think, slightly stiffer. I don't, I don't know if I truly believe that. Uh, I, I don't know if I truly um, uh, believe that, but you know, maybe it's just a, a psychological factor, but I do think that it does make the tear uh, just slightly easier, uh, consistent with, uh, with the uh, literature search. And so this is what you want to end up with. Something somewhat, some, uh, somewhat circular uh, intercapsorexis. Um, um, about five millimeters. The adult lens, I just wanna show you, it's fairly um, flat. The interior surface is fairly flat. So when you're trying to perform the tear in one direction, there's a counter force that's going in opposite direction. Uh, so it is actually, you know, when you're trying to tear a uh, paper, uh, you actually need counter traction and attraction. For example, like this, it actually, that counter traction has to go in opposite, completely opposite, 180 degrees in opposite direction for you to make this tear. However, in pediatric patients, the interior surface is pretty convex. Uh, so when you're trying to um, make a tear in one direction, uh, there's a counter traction, but also there's a, another force, a radial force that's going toward the equator toward the center of the lens. So that's why the net vector force is actually slightly in a diagonal fashion. And that is the reason why it is very easy for you to go um, and tear into the periphery toward the equator. Um, so the direction of the pull should be about 45 degrees. Um, 
45 degrees in this way. If you do it 90 degrees, it actually makes it, um, uh, it, it you can end up with uh, the capsorexis that's just too small. So what happens when you do um, uh, 45 degrees is that um, um, the tear, um, you wanna go in this direction. So, excuse me. Okay, anyway, so you wanna go 45 degrees because to counteract that radial force. Um, uh, the lensectomy, um, uh, make sure you move all lens cortex uh, with the, uh, because they tend to have a vigorous inflammatory conditions. And posterior capsule management, I typically remove posterior capsule if I cannot perform the YEC laser within one year. So if they're less than five years of age, or if they're not gonna be cooperative with the laser, I go straight to the uh, posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy. By the way, it is not advisable to just remove the posterior capsule without uh, uh, removing the uh, without uh, uh, removing the uh, anterior vitreous. I do know that people do that, and I do think that um, um, in my uh, in at least in my experience, uh, it uh, that the anterior high, the anterior surface of the vitreous tend to pacify pretty quickly in those situations. Uh, YAG problems, um, the problem with the YAG is that it does tend to recur. So it is not unusual for you to use a YAG on the same patient two or three times. Uh, when you're doing the pusher capsulotomy uh, or capsulectomy with a vitre uh, vitrectomy, uh, the, the ideal diameter of the anterior capsulotomy is five millimeters in diameter. Because remember, the lens diameter, the PCLL diameter is six millimeters. So if you make the inter capsule opening bigger than that, there's a chance of prolapse. So you wanna make it ideally five millimeters. Uh, the posterior capsule opening, the ideal diameter is about four millimeters. You wanna make it slightly smaller so that you don't have any problem um, with the lens dislocating. Um, and understanding, uh, when you do, are doing the surgery, surgical, the understanding the uh, surgical equipment is extremely critical. And Serena is gonna talk about that for the next 20 minutes. And then we're gonna talk about the, uh, we're gonna address um, many of the, the questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Serena, go for it. Well, first of all, thank you, Donnie, for um, um, arranging this uh, webinar. I'm happy to be here to share my surgical technique, um, my instrument with everyone. Um, you may uh, find that interesting because it's a slightly different. I developed my um, way to do pediatric cataract surgery for past uh, 15 years. So um, I think cataract surgery can be uh, uncomplicated. Uh, we don't really need a lot of uh, instrument. Instrument and techno technique I have uh, kind of developed over the years. Um, go through a lot of complicated way and I finally figured out this uh, easy way for me to do it and make things uncomplicated. Uh, hopefully, hope someone of you can think that's interesting. Here's the first slides. Uh, this is my cataract tray, uh, surgery tray. Uh, not very complicated, only a few things on there. After we remove those um, knobs for microscope, that's all we have. So I'm gonna go through each of them and uh, also my surgical videos, um, see how we do those uh, uncomplicated pediatric cataract surgery. Here. This is the, the little speculum I like to use. Um, you know, people use like different ways. This one's a small, it's a, it works even for the very small children like the uh, newborns. And this is called Alfonso without tap. Here's my, um, this is a point one, two, four steps. I always have two in my tray because they're, those are very important essential instruments. Uh, for pediatric cataract surgery, I think we are really can take advantage of general anesthesia. You can actually hold the eye instead of the eyeball wobbling around. So like Dr. Sanchez just talked about the counter force, 180 degree away, you hold the eye. Um, you can keep the eye really steady and um, make your surgery much easier and controlled. Uh, that's, I use this 0.124 step to that. 
Here's uh, some knives I use, and uh, you can see the first one is super, we call it super sharp blade. This just we use for pair paracentesis. The second one is 2.5 millimeter keratin. I use this for uh, my um, back lens, the MA, I mean, SN series for the in the back lens. Then this is a bigger knife, um, 3.5 millimeters. I use that for. Um, uh, Socus lens was well, three piece. We need a slightly bigger incision for that. Here's some picture of the knives. Uh, I don't know what brand you use. Um, the principle the same. The size matters. So um, here I want to show uh, this important the instrument I like to use. Um, don't know if you can see this. It's uh, called the micro incisional um, capsular forceps. Um, here we go, you, um, this uh, very important uh, instrument for me, for I have been using this for past 15 years, make a, a capsule erexis is so much easy and controlled versus you make a, a big incision to try to do this. Uh, because this uh, micro incision forces us to make um, your anterior chambers very stable, which is pretty much the key for pediatric cataract, especially infantile uh, cataract surgery because their eyes are very soft, uh, very um, um, bouncing, you know, unsta unstable. If you are capable of incision really small, and this is much easier, you can see that uh, you, your uh, capsule rexus uh, motions almost always pull toward the center toward the center, otherwise you will run out. So um, vision blue is really good. If you need that, there's nothing wrong with that to help you. So this capsule rexus forceps, um, this particular one's a Hoffman capsule rexus 23 gauge. Um, they're very, uh, they're different versions. I also have two different tips. One is a, um, a seizure uh, you use on this uh, normal kind of scissor uh, on this one. And this one is a, um, uh, side cut scissor. You will see those instruments are really, really helpful when you do some complicated cases such as PFV and pupillary remembrance, and you can use those in help you um, to manipulate uh, to do the procedure better. Here's the lens aspiration. Um, here, this I this is equ equipment uh, instrument is just a uh, retractor we all use. Pediatric cataract surgeon I'm very familiar with this, and I use a uh, irrigation slip sleeve over it. You can see this is a picture here. Um, you pull over it so um, it's coaxial um, to do it. So you make an incision and again you pay attention to I'm always holding the eye. You take advantage of that because kids are asleep and you uh, go start with the periphery. You use quick like a sweep motion, uh, sweep around over the periphery. It's um, Again, it's very important for pediatric cataract surgery. You really want to make a clean, clean surgery because they, uh, even you do a really good surgery, they still can rejuvenate the cortex. So yeah, this is just a quick showing um, all that being done. Um, I've been doing this technique for um, past 15 years. I think it works really good. If you have trouble get the sub incisional cortex, those old good instruments are still very helpful. Those are the um, IA, when I was resident of learning to the FACO, this is what we use for IA. Those have a 90 degree, a different angle of uh, aspiration tips. So uh, you can help you um, get this cortex out. I, I haven't used this for many, many years, but it's always available. Here, when, uh, Sometimes I do also, I also do bimanual procedures. Uh, when I don't put artificial lens, I just do bimanual. You can do bimanual for uh, even with lens, you just have in large incision. This is what I use. I, I like to use 20 gauge. Obviously you can do 23 and 25 gauge. I tried the, all of them, but they're not as efficient. Use 20, um, those 20 gauge so efficient, gets the uh, cortex out so much faster. So here, but the most important is when you do, I have this separate irrigation um, uh, cannula, but those important is whatever uh, gauge you use, you want to choose the same size of uh, knife. You want to keep your wound 
tight. So you have a very steady anterior chamber. Hey, this one, I also use, I use most, mostly 20 gauge. So this, the irrigation cannula is 20 gauge, it's just um, same. So here's a um, anterior, cap, anterior uh, capsula retract, uh, retract, re retracts capsule rexis here. Um, this, uh, I use the uh, irrigation cannula on my left hand and uh, my right hand that we use a uh, detractor. You can use, uh, again, 23 or 25 gauge, but 20 gauge works great. Um, you can only close your wound anyway, so you want to choose whatever is most efficient tool to get it done. So this gives you a nice um, anti-capsule uh, axis. Then you can do the same way. You um, oh, this is the same video. So apologize for that. So lens aspiration the same. You um, start from periphery and uh, go all the way across. I like to do just the clockwise. You can do anti whatever it works for you. I like to clean my sub incisional first because that's most imp most difficult part to. Um, to do it. So advantage for buy my new procedure is you can uh, switch hands. If you have a trouble get your subincisional uh, cortex out, you can switch hands, start from the other end, and uh, that will help you um, take the cortex out. Um, I think whatever way works for you is the best way to do the pediatric cataract surgery uh, or any kind of surgery. You will develop your own way and uh, find what is the uh, best, most efficient way to work with this. So you, you can, um, and for this particular case, I just take the out uh, center then do more on periphery. It's very important you keep clean more, the periphery make sure everything's uh, clean, clean, clean before you uh, move on to the next uh, step. So um, then you can go continue to do your, um, Retract me, and uh, this one is the same technique. You, uh, I show lots of band menu because I think more people use band menu than uh, my um, coaxial um, technique. So you can just continue. You don't have to take the instrument now. Just keep going. And after you do uh, the cortical cleanup, you make a small cut and, and a posterior capsule, and then do a really generous retractomy. Then you enlarge your posterior capsule just slightly smaller than your anterior capsule. And this, uh, if you don't put the lens, it's fine. If you're going to put the lens in the future, you get you left a very good support uh, for future IOL implant. Here's my um, tray for, I have the 20 gauge, I use Constellation, um, but I have you over the years, I used all kinds of um, machines, uh, Legacy and most of my machine we use the Alcon system. I use the adults machine as well. It's all the same. Uh, the principle is the same. You um, just want to uh, do the, here's uh, um, the other, next instrument on my tray is a, uh, injector for LOL. This uh, Monica 3 system, this system can do both focus lens and back lens. So you don't have to different injector anymore. So um, if, if people use the uh, Alcon lens, uh, this one, I, you just use different cartridge. You B cartridge for your uh, back lens, uh, uh, for the uh, focus lens and D cartridge for your back lens. <clears throat> I will show you. And also the here, there's the three little manipulators and so crook and hook or Maloney, whatever it likes for you. So look, I after I fill up the back, this is I have end to end posterior both capsule open, but you want to inject this lens in the back. Uh, the the key for this is uh, you lift up your tip, you don't um, dive your lens into the vitreous. You actually lift the tip up and put in the in the back. Uh, one good thing about this Alcon lens is they're acre soft. That they're so uh, soft, you uh, open up very slowly. You do have time to uh, position them. Here's the same injector I used. A uh, this is for uh, putting the sulcus. Uh, again, you fill up the sulcus. Use this 3.5 keratin open back. This this uh, cartridge is uh, bigger. You have to enlarge the wound a little bit. But I was using the same injector. And uh, this um, 
McPherson forceps is really helpful. You hold this uh, training haptic, you position it in the sulcus. But if it did not go to sulcus, you can always use your little uh, Sinsky hook or Moloney to reposition it. Um, here it is, you always, I recommend you, and I always suture the wound. You are taking care of children, infants, uh, they, uh, toddlers, they don't really know. They're not supposed to rub their eyes. Even if you make a small incision, I also close the wound. Uh, there's no downside to close the wound. So I'm, but I'm always use uh, absorbable suture here. This one's velcro suture, um, tangle velcro, needle holder, and tie in forceps. Um, here I'm showing you, um, I, I place the suture first, then I wash out the uh, viscoelastic. Um, I use the helon for everything. So this is, I wash out the helon front, in front and behind the lens, and you tie the wound, tie it up with this one stitch. Um, they will, this suture will, this uh, stitch will dissolve, dissolve itself after a um, week or two, sometimes a little longer, but it will, be gone by itself. You don't want to put those kids to sleep again um, because of this suture. So that's how they look. And uh, there's other things on my tray, like this little uh, scissors. So you um, finesse this, this forceps. Some of the corner surgeons like use this to cl close the wound. Um, Settler dialysis spatulas will be useful if you do, a you do a traumatic cataract or something. You need to uh, make sure there's no uh, you want to uh, uh, clean the snake yeah, or pos position the uh, iris. Here's uh, some pictures, uh, tangle vacuum suture look like on the uh, bimanual procedure. Here we'll go, um, here's some very important technique points and I figured out after many years through those surgeries, I think this will help you. You want to keep the eye fixated manually because you take advantage of pa uh, patient sleep. Uh, you hold the eye. So maintain a very stable anterior chamber. This is the key for those pretty much capable pediatric cataract surgery. You want your chamber um, stable. You have stable chamber, everything's easy. Otherwise you have a bouncing chamber. So tight fit wounds, that means your um, incision wound and instrument fit. Uh, if you do 20 gauge, use 20 gauge. You 25 gauge, 25 gauge incision. Minta, min, minimize times and in and out the eye. This is very important that um, you don't want to go in and out the eye a lot because every time you go in and out, you change the anterior chamber uh, um, pressure, the you, you chamber collapse, you push your um, vitreous move forward, um, cause a big mess. So uh, your instinct for inexperienced surgeon, like my fellows, when we do surgery, something. Uh, if something unexpected happened there, first thing they do is take the instrument out. I said, oh, don't do it. So first thing you do is stop and look. Take deep breaths. Don't take the instrument out of the eye because you'll make a big mess for yourself. Okay. So that's a few things to remember. And also the importance, your anterior capsule with macro incision in forceps. Try it out if you haven't done it. It's really great. Help you a lot. Lens aspiration, starting peripheral. Prefer this is very different with adults. Adults, you always do uh, take your nuclear out and then start from center to the periphery. But children, they have very jello kind of lens materials. So you can have very uh, quick clean up with just start on periphery. I don't do hydro dissection anymore. Um, it's nothing wrong if you want to do it, but I just found this really, um, to me, is unnecessary. With this uh, peripheral clean motion, I can get all the corticals cleaned really well without hydrodissection. And also a lot of those pediatric eyes have some uh, congenital abnormalities. They may have a uh, weak posterior capsule or even a opening. If you do a big hydrodissection, you could push everything back into the vitreous. You don't want to do that. So um, I also continue my posterior capsule, uh, capsulotomy with vitractor when I'm already there with my vitractor in my hand. I don't uh, come out and fill up the bag with helons and the redo a posterior capsule recipe. I think it's an extra step unnecessary, but if you do that way, it's nothing really wrong. Because, you know, we're surgeons, whatever works best for you, and uh, you uh, that's the best way to do surgery. Here, yeah, I want to show a quick um, uh, surgery, whole surgery for uh, my IOL 
a cut case. Uh, that um, super sharp blade open the wound and he long, I use he long injecting the anterior chamber and I open the anterior capsule with this um, um, cystone, but if you, you can use the forcep already sharp to open this, um, you can even save this step. So, you know, look the uh, motion is really push, uh, pulter, um, because those capsules are so easy to um, turn out, um, very different with adults. So enlarge the wound, notice this, my, I'm always, my second instrument holding this eye steady for me and uh, um, this for adults, they, you do paracentesis, you put second instrument. I don't think that's necessary for me, uh, but, but there's nothing wrong to do that too. So, so here, um, see clean the periphery cortex. And it's really, uh, this is not, this has been edited, but the real surgery doesn't take much longer than this, really. The entire surgery typical take about less than 20 minutes to do it if you, and even with a posterior capsule lot me and to attract me. As, uh, like we all know, it's not, not all about uh, how quick you do surgery. It's about efficient, um, do a good job, give uh, kids uh, good vision and minimize the complications you have to go back in the future. So here I'm continue. I don't take my instrument out of the eye. I continue going to the posterior capsule and make a posterior small capsule opening and uh, start doing vitrectomy. And after the vitrectomy, um, then I enlarge the posterior capsule uh, opening to just a slightly one millimeter smaller than my anterior capsule opening. Uh, that will make it easier for me to inject my lens in the back. Uh, if you make it too big, sometimes it's a little hard to do it. It's, yeah, you have to be, it, there's a small learning curve for that, but my fellow typical, after a few cases, they can do really well. Um, it just, you, you just uh, keep those few um, key points I just gave you, this will help you out. So now, lens, uh, heal on in the back, now I'm inject this lens. Uh, really nice open up the back. It's very important. Your back open up well for you. So you put this lens in the back. Uh, tip up again. Tip up. Don't don't dive in the matrix, and put in the back. Then you position it nicely in the back, and and you wash. Then I put suture. Then wash the heel on from top and bottom of the lens. Then um, here the, how they look at the end. So let, let's see, then um, here, uh, Iris Hook, Dr. Saul mentioned, it's really important, you can use lots of pediatric eyes, doesn't really look that beautiful for you. Their pupil after dilation, they're three, four millimeters. You need Iris Hook to help you open. And this is an intraocular cautery. This will be very helpful when you do some complicated cases like this, PFV. You uh, use Iris Hook, open up your wound. Uh, I don't, I'm not gonna go through, this is a long case. Uh, I opened, uh, um, I used the vitreo to open the anterior capsule or clean the cortical material. This is such a bad uh, PFV. I wasn't planning to keep any of my lens yeah. materials there too. Um, so I'm just showing you this quick, uh, quick uh, uh, this is the cautery here. You can see how the cautery work to, then you'll be attracting me. Okay, so. Um, your next one is, here's my tray. I have all the instruments on the tray if you want. Uh, take a look, see if you anything useful for you. Here are some pictures of my surgeries. They're not a particular pic, this is just daily work. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Song, and thank everybody listened. Hopefully, you all have a good day. I'm gonna just read some of these questions. How, technic um, how technically do you enlarge the posterior capsulotomy with the vitrector, just mechanically or using the aspiration or even other cuts? You know, uh, when you're uh, doing a posterior capsulotomy or capsulectomy with the vitrector, you're only using cutting machine. You're not aspirating because you do not wanna cause any traction on the retina. Um, so it's just cutting and suction motion, okay? Um, and then uh, do you also clean the equatorial part of the anterior capsule? Yes, uh, uh, 
the, it is very important to remove, uh, just like Dr. Wang said, it is very important to remove all the cortex, especially at the equator, because that's where the uh, progenitor's cells are. So you wanna make sure you wanna polish. After you finish, polishing the, 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 the surface underneath the uh, anterior capsule all the way to the equator, I think is critical. This is my opinion. That actually can, I think that if you don't do a good job with this, uh, the chance of opacity and even glaucoma, uh, I think is higher. Uh, I think that's extremely important. After a hydro dissection, do you ask, after a hydro dissection, do you aspirate the center of the lens and shape the lens into a cartwheel? Um, you know, the, um, Dr. Wong actually removed the peripheral cortex first before removing the uh, the uh, the nucleus. I actually that's exactly what I do in adult patients. The lenses are stiffer; they're harder. So uh, what you know, most people what for adult cataracts they remove the nucleus. They uh, they uh, they remove the nucleus and try to collapse. The, the peripheral cortex, but in pediatric patients, because the lens is so soft, um, it's actually, I think it's far more advantageous to remove the cortex and the periphery, especially the sub incisional cortex, because that is truly the most difficult part to remove. So with the lens in place, it is easier to, uh, to place the, um, uh, the aspiration, uh, the IA, right at the sub incisional cortex because the lens is actually pushing it in that direction and um, it, it's actually giving you counter traction. So it is, remember, it's attraction and counter traction. You always want to think about that. So when you're cutting, removing anything, as you want to take advantage of that counter, um, uh, uh, counter uh, traction from the lens and the nuclear material to remove the sub incisional cortex. So you wanna, I, I typically remove the cortex first. Uh, why do you use the Vicro suture to close the wound? Uh, is it important? Um, I have done surgeries in 40 different, 40 different locations around the, around the world. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, uh, the surgical techniques are very, very different in different places around the world. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not gonna tell you where, but in some places, they never use vicro sutures because it is expensive. Heno vicro suture is actually very expensive and they never use it and even in a congenital cataracts. But the thing is that they do these surgeries in five minutes and they do it very quickly and, the, uh, and they try to minimize a surgical incision site. And so they feel pretty comfortable not placing any suture and in their, tw I, you know, I think they actually have done, I think it was a 200,000 cases of congenital cataracts and they have never had a case of endophthalmitis. So after witnessing that, uh, I'm gonna just tell you that is it, is, it, is it a must? I don't think so, but I do think that it's highly recommended placing a vicro suture uh, if it is definitely available definitely available. I would recommend because the, the eyeball, the sclera tends to be soft and it tends to collapse easier, especially in patients with uh, Down syndromes or patients with any type of chromosome abnormalities or developmental delays. Uh, they're going to be pretty aggressive with eye rubbing. So I think that having the vicro suture there, I think uh, it just would make, make me feel better. Another question is that would the vicro suture cause scarring and white opacity at the surgical incision site? No. As long as you don't uh, encapsulate and, 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 and catch the conjunctiva and accidentally place a conjunctiva on the cornea, no. It shouldn't really uh, result in significant opacity. And remember, just like Dr. Wang and I, we, we go from 12 o'clock incision. So the eyebrow, the eyelid, covers that surgical incision site very nicely. Um, have you tried parse plana approach on patients whom you're not placing the IOL? Yes, I actually used to do a parse plana approach in the past, um, but I just don't feel that is uh, necessary, in my opinion. Again, it's a matter of preference, and I think it's an excellent procedure, and it is a safe procedure, but just, Dr., uh, just like Dr. Wang said, you wanna make the procedure as 
simple as possible with less movement going in and out. So parse plane approach, I just felt that it requires an additional, uh, that's an additional surgical incision site. Um, so I don't do it, um, but I've not gonna do it. Um, I've act actually, uh, those cases went beautifully. Do you use, um, um, do you use a, um, a trimsunolone um, uh, after the procedure? Yes, I do. Sorry, excuse me. Um, um, sorry. Um, the, uh, do you use trimsunolone and uh, after the procedure? Yes, I actually injected intra, uh, intracameral and also subconj. Uh, Serena, do you use trimsunolone? Uh, only selected cases for um, traumatic cataracts, uh, stuff like that. I, you know, I don't, it just really, I really hasn't have a need for those kids to do really well. So I, I do a subconjunctive injection of uh, solid, some steroids, solid measure. So uh, I personally, uh, you know, if I, I actually take care of a lot of patients with the developmental delays. So these patients, uh, you know, I, I'm, I am concerned that they may not be able to place the, uh, the eye drops. Uh, so I actually do intercameral, uh, but I don't think it's essential, no. Um, I think uh, just like uh, Serena, subconjunctival or just frequent eye drops of uh, prednisolone acetate or phosphate every hour for about a week, I think is sufficient. Um, because the uh, intracameral tramsonolone is extremely expensive. Um, um, so, and then let me just see. Um, uh, post phaco is oh do you do do you perform iridectomy? Uh, no. Um, again, uh, I, I think when I was uh, when I was trained when I was in training twenty five years ago, we used to do iridectomy on every patient uh, because of the concern of the uh, the ankle closure because of the um, uh, the iris bombay. No, uh, you know these procedures. Uh, I think uh, I've never I have n I, I cannot remember the. I have never regretted for not performing iridectomy. So, and Serena? Um, yeah, well, with the only with very small eyes, when I put the L out in the eye, when they're like small down the cornea, I do a peripheral PI, but most time, no, not, not routinely. Uh, and then what is the best age of the implantation IOL uh, in, in pediatric patient cataract surgery? I think we went over that. So please go back to the, uh, uh, the slides. And do you use trimsunolone, especially in rubella cases? Um, so for rubella cataracts, uh, uh, you know, especially in certain places like in Vietnam or certain places in uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries of South America, uh, they have a fairly high cases of rubella because of lack of vaccinations. But it is, I think it's improving. Uh, for those cases, it is very important that you make sure that you do not have any ladies who are pregnant or possibly pregnant in the OR. So I make sure that I remove them from the operating room. And I typically do, I actually do use tramsunolone in rubella cases, but these patients do require um, uh, closer observations after the surgery. Um, uh, the, um, uh, how many days or weeks, baby? Okay. Uh, how many days do you wait between the, uh, between um, uh, the uh, the right and left eye uh, for bilateral cataracts? So, like I said, um, uh, I personally uh, do I have anything against doing cataract surgeries on the same day uh, for bilateral cases? No. I, I, I do not. Uh, if you look at the literature, I do think that we don't have enough evidence to really say, you know what, that is a malpractice. No, I don't believe that. Uh, and, and in certain situations, I think uh, bilateral cataract surgeries on the same setting is warranted. But I would recommend that you change the drapes, change the IV bag, change the entire setting, um, uh, to, re to reduce the risk of endophthalmitis um, uh, in these pediatric patients. Um, um, but I personally uh, typically wait about between two to four weeks between, uh, between the cases, right and left eye. Serena? I do one week apart always to avoid, yeah, to avoid amblyopia. Okay, perfect. And then um, uh, I'm gonna see, um, I think that's it. So it is nine o'clock. Um, as you know, I 
I am like by the book. I actually like to just stay on time. And I know some of you guys, uh, it's a very early in the morning and some of you, it's a very late in the um, evening. And um, again, I love doing this and I love, um, you know, Dr. Wong, he's a very experienced surgeon. And if you are interested in hearing more about the congenital cataract surgeries, a particular aspect of the surgeries or anything else, please uh, post, please, um, uh, you know, please, uh, we have Facebook, the Orbis has a Facebook, LinkedIn and other social media um, um, platform. So please let us know. And we read every single one of those comments. So please, if you're interested, we would love to do it again. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.